The Day Show on TV3 and it's proudly brought to you by Forever Clear. Live from Accra, Ghana, welcome to The Day Show. Ladies and gentlemen, here's your host, Bella Mundi. He came from a broken home, got into bad company. One thing led to another until that day in 1990 when he was condemned to death by firing squad. Today on The Day Show, we get inspired by the story of a man who dedicated his life to God. And this was a promise he made many years ago if God spared his life. And it could have been me, it could have been you. Anyone at all can end up behind bars. But what really is life like behind bars and after prison? That's what we're discussing on the day show today. And of course, this show is proudly brought to you by Forever Claire. A big thank you going out to See My Brew, to Oh My Hair, and to Faze Veal. Thank you for tuning in. We'll be back. Purchase your Forever Clear sanitizers and help support the eradication of COVID-19. Well, before he tells his story, it's time for BU. Let's share some nuggets of wisdom. My dad, Charles Alenji Mamley, his soul rest in peace, said to me that you is a blessed time. However, the blessedness of youth is only and fully realized when it has passed. Now, there are some of you sitting here today that feel you have time because you are 20-something or you're 30-something, or you've heard people actually say life begins at 40. No, your life begins when you land on this planet Earth. Live each day wisely, Keep good company. Read when you can. We know that in all our getting, we must get understanding. You're welcome back. That was the BU segment. We'll play catch up much later and then we'll get to meet my guest. Keep watching, it's the day show. Thank you, Bella. My name is Helen. Of course, you're welcome to catch up. I'm going to be giving you bite-sized stories, as always, from everything social, lifestyle, entertainment, and of course, international. Speaking of international, let's get on to our very first story. Now, our very first international story takes us to the southern city of Guangzhou. We're hearing, unfortunately, that many African students and expats are still being discriminated against. They are being evicted from homes, hotels, apartments over coronavirus fears. We're hearing that some are being tested, they don't know what the results are, and some are just being discriminated against based on their race. Now, we're hearing that many African leaders have written to the Chinese foreign minister to tell them to curb this uh, very unpleasant plight facing many Africans in Guangzhou. We're also hearing that this discrimination could be happening to Chinese nationals living in Africa. We're hoping this doesn't turn into a tit for tat. Now, let's take it back to Accra, Ghana. A more exciting update for everybody. We're being told that uh, doctors, nurses, and hospital staff at the Greater Accra Regional Hospital have tested negative for the coronavirus. Now, this follows a story that we brought to you two weeks ago concerning former Musica President Obor's father. He passed away on March 27th following a coronavirus diagnosis. Now, we're being told that the former musical president of war is contesting this diagnosis, it would appear, allegedly, and has asked for an autopsy to confirm this diagnosis. We will be following the story closely and bringing you any more updates as the story unfolds. Now, on to our very last story, and surprise, surprise, more coronavirus updates. CNN anchor Chris Cuomo's wife has tested positive for COVID-19. Now, this follows um, Chris Cuomo himself's diagnosis of the corona 
virus. He mentioned this on telly when he was speaking to his brother, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. The father of three, Chris Cuomo, said that this diagnosis has shaken his entire family to the core. He says that he had more severe symptoms such as shortness of breath, he had a cough and a fever. His wife, Christina, however, had the milder symptoms of the novel COVID-19 disease. Now, we're hoping that anybody that is afflicted has a very speedy recovery. So, it is a wrap. Thank you so much for joining me this week on Catch Up. I cannot wait to see you again next week. I hope you're all staying home as much as possible, washing those hands, and of course, social distancing. Over to you, Bella. And that was Catch Up. Remember that every week we update you on what's happening in Ghana and the rest of the world. In the meantime, let me just remind you to keep washing your hands, keep using your sanitizers, stay two meters away from everyone, of course, practice social distancing and stay safe. In this time of coronavirus, we unfortunately cannot have as many people in the auditorium because we are also practicing social distancing. And so just in case you notice, do pardon us. But thank you again to my audience for making time with us. And I hope that today their life will be changed based on the story they're about to hear. And so on that note, I'd like to invite upstage Reverend David G. Messi. A round of applause for him. Thank you so much, Reverend. And you can have a seat. Naturally, I'll shake you, but of yes, course, I understand. we're in dire time. So. But thank you so much for agreeing to do this with us. God bless I hope you. you're doing well. Very well. Okay. I want us to start telling the story all the way from the top. Because reading your profile, I realized that you came from a broken home. Yeah. And so let's start from that point. How young were you then, and what happened? Well, I, 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 I began to realize my surroundings when I was about five years old. Mm. Yeah, and then, uh, at, that, at that time, I was, I was living with my dad. He was a senior military officer in the army. I had no mom at the time. Okay. Because my dad didn't marry my mom. Oh. Yeah, but, okay. and it wasn't long, and then my dad began to go out with a very beautiful lady. Okay. She happened to be a nurse. It wasn't long, this lady came into our home, and um, at that time, I got to realize that she was my mom. Because my dad told me that was my mom. Oh, okay. And I really loved her. She loved me. Mm. And um, That was your biological or this no, is a different... Okay, that was okay. my father's wife. Okay, mom. okay. I, 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 I hate calling her my stepmom because yeah. she brought me up. Okay. What even really fascinated me about her was that whenever we went out with her, she introduced me to her friends as her friend's born son. Yeah, so oh, I was very great. proud of her. Okay. Yeah, it was very good. And then we also had some relatives at home. Okay. My dad's... Relatives. So the extended family lived yeah, the extended with you family. as well. We were living with them. Yes. Okay. So as I was growing up, um, I misconstrued my mother. You see, I was a very adventurous boy, and uh, I, I was always out prying to things, you know. And in my course of prying to things, I destroy things mm. because I wanted to learn. Okay. You see, but unfortunately, um, she didn't see it that way. You see, and. Uh, most times when daddy comes back from work, the reports at home are not very good. Mm. You know, and daddy also didn't really take time to know why certain things happen, you see. So being a military officer with that dis discipline in him, he also wanted to discipline me. You see, but eventually, the way my dad disciplined me, I, it made me develop a negative fear for him. Mm. So it's not, I was, my dad was not like, even though I, I loved him as my father, but I could not sit down with my father and chat. And chat. Yeah. You don't understand. And all, all the time, because of what was going on at home, and the way my stepmother was always out with me, she had that character of a nurse in her. Mm. So when her child is going wrong, she, she had her mood or her mode of discipline me, you understand? Yeah. But instead of me subjecting myself to that discipline, I rather saw it as hatred. Mm. You know, and uh, being incited by my cousin, my father's relative at home that because she was not my mom, that is why she disciplined me like that. Okay. And it, it made me develop a very negative hatred for, for my stepmom. You see, so in other words, as much as they try to inculcate into me the good things, the good values, yeah. I was not accepting them. I was a boy that I pilfer, you know, I yeah. steal coins and things like that to school. And then one day I bumped into heavy money in my dad's briefcase. And knowing 
very well that there's money there. I continue to enter the briefcase and steal and more steal. money. You see, and at the point in time, I began to steal the money from my father's Batman to do my laundry for me. Because I was then preparing to go into secondary school. Mm. And my dad had instructed that no one should do my laundry so that I could do my laundry Learn. myself before I got into school, you know. So I had to steal money for the Batman to do these things for me. And it went on and on, and one day I was caught. Okay, but wait, before you carry on, do you even know who the Batman is? The Batman is uh, the one who does the, the laundry and chores at home for a military officer. I see, okay, yeah. let's carry That's on. <laughs> <laughs> at least you've learned something today, right? Honestly, I was thinking of the movie. <laughs> I was like, okay, what's going on here? <laughs> okay, please carry on. Yes, and uh, I was caught. Dad, Daddy was so angry that he wanted to send me to a juvenile correctional institute. Wow. Because he felt that all the discipline he was giving me at home wasn't yielding any results. So now he intended, you know, he's a, he's a soldier, a soldier, a, dis a man of discipline. You yeah. know? So he wanted to do everything to make sure that he plucks out that bad nature out of out me. Out of you. But lo and behold, I had passed my common entrance very well. Uh. And his friend advised him that, look, Major, instead of sending your son to that institute, send your son to the secondary school, hoping that discipline on campus will change it me. Changed. Unfortunately. It didn't. When I got into secondary school in the north and saw these boys whose nature were like me. And mm -hmm. you see, this was a bit higher because these were kids coming from Accra. Okay. And almost every holiday, they spend their holidays out of the country. Mm -hmm. And when they come back, I, I, I just love their way of life, you know, so I joined myself to them. See, at the age of 16, I had learned how to smoke marijuana. At the age of 16, yes. you learned this in secondary in, school? I learned it in secondary school. I bumped into a gang, a gang of smoking students. Yeah. And that was how I got initiated into that gang. Wow. Yeah. And uh, at that age also, I had other girlfriends in other secondary Other girlfriends? Yeah, yeah. Hey! Oh, yeah. Hello! H how many, roughly? Uh, I remember at that time, I had about four. Hey! <laughs> at once? Yes. Wow. 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 Uh, because I wasn't having time for my books, I quite remember most times when my terminal reports arrive at home, Daddy calls me reads the terminal report to me, and once he's not happy, he advises me. And almost invariably, when daddy is advising me, I end up weeping, mm. because I knew I had a problem. Yeah. But the power to come out of that problem was not there. So daddy will advise me, I'll weep. When I get up from his presence, the very thing he tells me not to do is what, you do. Is what I go back to do again. So one day, my dad looked at my character and cautioned me, David, if you don't watch out, your character may lead you into prison one day. Wow, your father said that. Oh, yes, my dad said that. It entered here and came out. <laughs> so, and I continued in my bad nature. Into my fourth year, the school expelled me. I was expelled from school. Um, the school I attended was a very good school in the north, one of the very best schools in the north, you know, and... Um, Unfortunately, when I came home, <laughs> it was not long I realized the things that I was doing and how bad I was. So I, I, I immediately changed and I asked Daddy to get me back into another school. Unfortunately, um, I remained home for two academic years. Hmm. Daddy didn't send me back to school. He attempted once, but I don't know changed what happened. Changed his mind, yeah. But any time I am with my dad, I try and convince him and he agrees to send me to school. But I don't know what happened. By the next morning, Change his mind. my dad is no longer interested in sending me back to school. So with time, I became very useful to him on his rice farm. My dad was a military officer, but he was a part-time rice farmer on a mechanical scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because I was that intelligent, in no time, I began to operate his farm machinery with dexterity. You know, and he could boast to people that, look, my son knows how to operate. My, my son is technically inclined. And as he kept at it, one day I called my dad and said, Daddy, since you know that I'm technically inclined, why not get me into a secondary, secondary technical school or a technical school to become an engineer to help the family business? He said, oh, yes, 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 what you are saying is right. Mm -hmm. My dad goes into the bedroom. By the time he comes back the next morning, he his mind. it's a different story altogether. Wow. So I stayed home for three years. Mm -hmm. In fact, at a point, I became very peeved. You know, the problem was that I didn't really have anyone to counsel me. It was only this friend whom I knew in the barracks who had taught me these bad things, whom I knew. So whenever I have a problem, I run to him. To them, and unfortunately, yeah. he gives me wrong counsel. 
But then at the time, I thought it was okay. Yeah. Yeah. So for three years, I stayed at home. Then this friend suggested to me that, look, David, I happened to go to Holland and I was deported. There are guys like you in Holland making it big time. Why sit here and suck your mother's breast? At the time, I was about 18. I was between 18 and 19 years. Let's get money so that we go. So he now he taught me what to do. And behind my dad's back, after we had harvested, I stole a whole truckload of rice. From your father? From my father's farm. And then sold it behind my father. And by the time they realized, I was going into the world. Before you even continue with the story, <laughs> I mean, wow. Okay, so we're talking about life in and outside prison. We'll be back to continue. Mm -hmm. Purchase your Forever Clear sanitizers and help support the eradication of COVID-19. Welcome back. It's the day show. It's proudly brought to you by Forever Clear. And in the studios, I have a reverend who spent 19 years in prison. If not for the mercy of God, you should have been funeral by now. Oh. Yeah because he was condemned to death by firing squad. For some reason, uh, he was spared. And today he's telling his story. And so if you just joined our story, we're just about getting into the most exciting part. And so Reverend, let's continue. Yeah. And so I fled home at the age of 19 um, with the intention of traveling to Holland with my friend. It was a lot of money. But, you know, he was smarter than me. Yeah. I was a green when I left Tamale to Accra. You yeah. know, and those were, that was in 1983 when there was an embargo. The borders were closed. Everything in Ghana was at a standstill. Yes, but then when I got down south here to Ghana, uh, to Accra, my friend behind my back swindled the money, you know, oh. and then ran away with almost all the money. He left me just a little part of the money. I, was, I looked for my friend, I couldn't find him. Mm -hmm. I couldn't go back home because I knew my dad. Yeah. When my dad gets angry, he easily takes his shotgun. Ooh. Oh, yes. He's, he's chased me with his shotgun twice. Wow. I was a very bad boy. Very bad boy. In fact, let me be honest. Today, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to give birth to a son like me. Wow. Oh, yes. Because I was a pain to my dad. I must confess. Mm. Okay? I wouldn't want to have a son like me. No. Nope. Unbelievable. Oh, I... yes. <sighs> and uh, <laughs> so I knew when I get back to Tamale, my dad was mad. You hold on before that. So as you are sitting there now, <laughs> would you want to give birth to someone like you? <laughs> no? <laughs> she says no. <laughs> are you that bad? <laughs> well, yeah, we're trying to change lives with this story. Reverend, yeah. please carry on. So the length and short was it that I, I, I didn't have money to go to Holland. So I rather found myself in Nigeria. That was when Ghanaians were traveling, traveling to Nigeria. To, yes, okay. I found myself in Nigeria. When I got to Nigeria, I regretted ever traveling to that country. Because from an army officer's bungalow, with all the privileges that I had as mm -hmm. a child, I now found myself sleeping in ghettos. Wow. And to survive, I had to carry concrete. Ooh. I had to dig trenches. Wow. You know, and almost things I wouldn't have done mm -hmm. if I had only stayed home. at home. I was doing them to survive. After two years, I realized life wasn't good. So I came back to Ghana. Mm. My mistake was that I should have gone back to my dad. At least like the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. And then just say, Daddy, I'm sorry. But, you know, I had a kind of pride in me that I knew I was going to make it in life and go and boast to the old man. Mm. That after all, what? I stole your money. Here am I. I've made it. Here's yeah, your money. Here's Take your it. money. Take it. <laughs> you know, and... Um, I, instead of going back home, I now re-strategize. I knew some friends who had traversed the desert, and I, was not, I didn't hear of them again, so I heard they had entered into Europe. So I made my mind that, hook or crook, I was going to traverse the desert and then get back. Now, I had planned everything. The day before our travel, I slept. I knew nothing about dreams. I knew nothing about God. I was not a Christian I was born in a Christian home. We go to church, but it's yeah, a nominal it Christian was... home. You know, and when you go, I mean, what they teach in church, I don't understand. Yeah. I had this strange dream. And in this dream, I saw myself playing with some people under a, the base of a hill. Then suddenly, I began to climb the hill. And there was somebody at my right side 
who looked like a white woman. And there was an agreement between us in the dream, and as we, we walked uphill together, I don't know what happened, then suddenly she vanished. Mm. And then I continued uphill alone. At a point, I stepped on some weed, and then something came out of the weed like a trap. This trap the hunters use in the forest. Yeah. Caught hold of my right foot, and within a split of a second, it tripped me over, and I fell into a very deep, dark pit. I went deep, 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 deep down this pit. And at the point, it was like I was going down physically. Mm. I don't know what happened. Something jolted me out of sleep, only to find myself lying on bed. Mm. I could not sleep the rest of the night. So in the morning, I was living with my sister, my elder sister. I narrated a dream to her, and she told me her husband, his name is Steve, has insight into dreams, so I should wait. When he comes, I can narrate the dream to him. And when Steve came, I narrated the dream to him. Steve sat down for a while and said, David, that deep pit into which you fell is a serious trouble. Mm -hmm. You see, the woman whom you saw by your side is a woman God is sending from her country to be your wife. So please watch it. Else, because of that woman, you fall into a very serious trouble. Then after a while, he sat and told me that, look, David, now I feel I have to tell you this. Because of that woman, don't get involved with any woman with a black skin. Mm. Else, if you do that, that woman will be the vehicle through which you have this problem. Okay. In fact, I, I got scared. I decided not to travel again, but what is written is written. Is written. So I traveled. I found myself in Wagadugu. In no time, within about a year and a half, I've, I got myself involved into tourism. <laughs> within six months, I had made lots and lots of friends from the West. And I was making good money. <laughs> At a point in time, I made so much money that I decided to go into gold business. I wanted to sell gold for profit. In fact, going to Europe was now out of my mind because I told yeah. myself that I'm going to these, these whites. And now they are coming here yeah, to Africa, exactly. to me. And I make good money. So why travel again? So I decided to do some gold business. I came to Kumasi. In the course of negotiating the business like this room, suddenly a door opened. And out of this door came a very beautiful woman. Let me say she's a lady, very young. She was in her 20s. Okay. And all the features of this lady were the type that when I see with my eyes, I can't, can't. let go. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She was as beautiful as you are. Oh, thank you very much. But don't worry, I won't bring you trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so in no time I wooed her, she became my girlfriend. And uh, this was a lady... I smoke marijuana, she smokes marijuana. Mm -hmm. I smoke cigarettes, she smokes. I drink, she drinks very well. Yeah. And she was a nightclub type. Okay. You know, and uh, I come with cash. So she now began to teach me how to spend my money well. Mm. Yes. Uh, we go out. <laughs> I, I did nothing with my money but nightclubbing. But just, yeah. Enjoying. I went to Cote d'Ivoire with her. I spent all the money that I used for the gold. I sold the gold. I spent everything in, 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 in Abidjan. Came back to Ghana with nothing. Oh. So I had to go back to my father. You know, before that, I had come to Ghana and gone to my father, apologizing and okay. accepted okay. me. And my dad wanted me to stay home so that he, plan, he replants my life. But I received. But didn't, okay. I had my own plans. Yeah, but when I came back from Cote d'Ivoire with this lady, I sent her to my dad. Immediately, my dad saw her. He said, David, no. Let this woman go. Mm. I asked my father, what is it? He said, something in him is telling him that this woman is not the right woman for you. So, lady, let him. Now, I told myself, daddy, when you were going after ladies, who told you to leave those ladies? <laughs> and I have had mine. And, and you're, you're telling asking me. me. Yeah. You see, little did I know that God was saving me from trouble. So, I went to this lady with my dad. I was not having money to travel. And... I told her what I had done to travel, and she told me you can do it again. No, she incited me, you know. So behind my dad's back again, I stole another truckload of rice again. Oh, a day. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Your father didn't find out. My dad found, found out. Okay. Today, I, I feel very sorry saying these things because yeah. um, I really regret them. Yeah. I wish they had never happened. And so I traveled with this lady back to Wagadugu. The length and short was that in the line of my duty, 
I came across an American lady. I had met countless American ladies and other whites. But I don't know, this particular lady, when I saw her, immediately I saw her, my heart just came out of me, entered into her. Hey. And I wanted her. So you left the woman you were with? The woman I was with was her home. She had given birth then. Oh, okay. So quickly I ran home and told her that, look, I've met an American lady. I told her you are my sister. So when she comes home, accept it that way. So this white lady eventually, I mean, you know, the Ghanaian hospitality, mm -hmm. she, she got carried away. So she left her camping resort and came and stayed with us at home. It wasn't long. She began to show me a lot of love. Mm. But my Ghanaian lady was jealous. Yeah. And she warned me, they me touch the white lady. She would tell the white lady that she She's was my wife way. and that there was no way out for her. And I knew whites are such that the more they get one truth about, one lie about you, it's difficult for it's them difficult. to trust you again. Yeah. You see? So I, I tried to keep it. But one day I was coming from town, and when the white lady saw me, she ran to hug me. But that was a day of decision. But while she was coming, my Ghanaian lady stood behind and was watching because she had warned me not to touch her. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want the white lady to know the secret. So instead of hugging her, I swept her and took her hand. <laughs> the length of show, my white friend now closed up. She became angry with me and turned her friendship onto my girlfriend. And that was when we got to know that the white lady was a rich woman. She had money on her. She had a lot of things. So she decided to come to Ghana. The night before we traveled, my Ghanaian lady called me behind. And after we had done our thing, you know, mm. she, she advised me literally. David, and I said, oh, what can we do? Mm -hmm. What can we do? Then she said, no, we will not allow it. So this is what we do. David, Wow. Hold on. Hold on. It's getting hot. Is it not? You want to hear more? Yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah. It's okay. We have clothes. Go home. <laughs> well, anyway, we'll be back. It's getting even more exciting here with Reverend David G. Mercy, who's telling us a story about how he ended up in jail for 19 good years and how God saved him. It's a day show. We'll be back. Purchase your Forever Clear sanitizers and help support the eradication of COVID-19. You're welcome back. And well, you know what your parents advise you to watch the company you keep? Most times you have to really listen to them. And I can say I'm one example of someone who didn't listen to my mom. I made the mistake and came back and said, oh. Can you imagine what the mistake was? Broken hearts. <laughs> anyway, so Reverend David G. Mercy is here and he's telling us a story about how he ended up in jail for 19 years. Could have been killed, but God came through for him yeah. and he's here telling us his story. Thank you so much, by the way. God bless you, my dear. Now let's carry on. You said your girlfriend then asked you to harm the white yeah. woman so you can take her property. Exactly. All right. And um, stupidly on my part and foolishly on my part, what she said entered into me. Mm. And I began to nurse it. I traveled with the American lady from Ouagadougou. We entered through Ghana, to Ghana, through Tumu, the Tumu border. Mm. And I kept battling this in my mind. I kept battling it in my mind. When we got to Tumu, I bought the usual thing, my marijuana, mm. because I was craving for the Ghana type. You yeah. know, the Ghana type, you know. I bought my marijuana, and lo and behold, on our journey to Wa, we were late. So she, she asked, the white lady, American lady asked that we camp in the bush. But I have camped in the bush several times with a tourist. Oh, I see. But with a lady alone in my company, that was the first time. Okay. You know, and um, we entered into the bush, we set up camp, we did everything. I was contemplating. Sometimes I get so much, you know, but it's like she was cold towards me, you see. So I was trying to, I was trying to develop a very good relationship with her. Uh, but some way, because I snubbed her and I didn't take her hug, some way, somehow, you know, and uh, at the time I wasn't matured. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I left her after we had taken supper. I went further into the bush. I went and smoked my thing. And by the time I had finished smoking my thing, it's like a spirit entered into me. 
And it was like, if I don't do this, I was going to lose something precious. Mm. So I came back to the camp, and while the white lady was not aware, I hit her with an object, and she blacked out. Almost immediately, it's like something just fell off my eyes, and I realized that what I had done was very wrong. I did everything to revive my friend. About two to three hours later, she revived. It, it was a long process. I did many things. Mm. She revived, and I was very happy. Knowing very well what I had done to her because of the pain that she had on her head, she questioned me, I lied. And because she didn't know I was the one who did it, mm. she somewhat believed it. But the mistake that I did was that I told her, let me send you to the hospital at Wa, so that at least you can be taken care of. She told me to wait because it's night. When day by daybreak, she's still feeling pain, and then we go to the hospital. That was the saddest mistake I made in my life. By daybreak in the morning, my American friend was dead. <gasps> A very pathetic story. You see, I'm able to tell you these things because... Wow. I'm able to tell you these things because the things that I went through, God has asked me to tell his artists. Mm. Because there is something in it that especially the youth are to learn lessons out of. Okay? Yeah. Are you, are you learning anything so far? Yeah? <laughs> My American friend died. I concealed the crying in the bush. Huh? Fled with her car to Bogatanga, abandoned the car, took all the money in the car with the intention of traveling far away because then I knew that I had created a serious problem. Mm -hmm. When I got back to Wagadugu, to my girlfriend, the first question she asked me was that, where is the money? That's what she asked you? Oh, yes. So that means that she was expectant. Yes, that she, she was expectant to... because she knew I was going and I was going to come back with the money. How did it feel like when you noticed she was dead? In fact, I, I became sick. I don't know how to describe it, but my conscience made me feel sick. I felt my hands were stained. Wait, yeah. And it's like wherever I go to, it's like the whole world was chasing me. Hmm. I wish I had somewhere to go and hide. Even though nobody knew about what I had done, but I was not myself. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. Words cannot describe how I felt. To the point that when I came home and I gave her the money, and when she took the money, she was so happy. She took the money, opened it, threw some in the air, oh. spread some on the bed. And with all her excitement, she realized that I was not excited. Then she told me this, David, you know something? The, the, the American lady's spirit is bothering you. Wait, I'm coming. So she went out. A few minutes later, she came back and told me that, David, you know what? I'm in my period. I've soak my blood in a bucket of water. Go and bath it. My spirit will overcome that of the white lady. Huh? What? Wait, what, wait, what? Oh, what? Oh. Did he do it? Oh. Hey! <laughs> you did? Until you get to the point where I was, and you become desperate, like the way I was desperate, you will not understand why I had to do it. But I got up and followed her to the bathroom and I bathed the water because I wanted a way out of my conscience. Wow. But unfortunately, I bathed that water, but my conscience continued to bother me. Eventually, we came back to Ghana. You know, the money we had from nightclub to nightclub, we squandered the money. All along, while I was running in Ghana and whatnot, the parents of the lady were seeking out for the lady. And when they could not find her, they notified the American government. Oh, my God. And the American government unleashed into West Africa their usual network mm -hmm. through their, their, their missions. And they were combing everywhere for their citizen. At a point, I became so much of a drunkard because I, 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 I don't know, I, I, I wanted a way out. So I had to go and hide in my girlfriend's father's village in the Ashanti region. Because I knew that eventually my sins were going to catch up with yeah. me. But lo and behold, an investigation was initiated. And Ghana police, I commend them very much. They were able to track me. You commend them for tracking you? Oh, they did. Because, <laughs> no, you know, if intelligence, if their intelligence wasn't that adequate, yeah. they wouldn't have been able to get me. These were the days of President Rawlinson's military era. Okay. okay. You know, so the security was, come on. Mm. 
they were able to track me to Kumasi, and Interpol came and arrested me. That was on the 8th September 1989. And it was obvious that in the, under the PNDC era, my end had come. Yeah. I mean, I quite remember <laughs> some of these uh, top, uh, top brass at the mm -hmm, time mm -hmm. came to the police headquarters to see me. And they told me that they were going to kill me. And I knew I was going to die. I knew I was going to die. Uh, during the police investigation, <laughs> I, they touched my body. Mm. I was really tortured. Mm. But I made up my mind that no, because based upon what my girlfriend had told me, she told me that to be a man, you need to conceal the secret. That makes you a man. Wow. See, and I wanted to be the man for her. How did she have so much power over you? You can't just imagine it. You can't just imagine it. So I concealed the secret, you know. And uh, even though eventually they touched me, some of the secrets were coming out gradually, gradually, gradually. But then, in the end, I was in the police headquarters cells. Then, I don't know, my skin began to deteriorate. Um, some kind of insects were in the cell, and the hygiene in the cell was not, mm. it, it was, was not good for my body. My skin began to deteriorate. So then my CID transferred me from the police cell to the James Ford prison. Okay. But I think it was God that had done that it that way. There. Yeah, when I got to the James Ford prison, the environment was quite okay. But deep down me, I knew that my end had come. And yeah. I was not myself. I was always weeping within me because I always asked myself, why should I have gone to that extent of committing such a crime? Why even should I even have listened to this woman? Yeah. See, one day I was brooding over my predicament under the shed in the James Ford prison. And an old man accosted me. Then he asked me, my son, looking at you, your caliber, of, no, your caliber is not here in the prison. What are you doing here? Yeah. This is literally the way you put it. We are Dadaba. Uh -huh. I had so that how did you end up? And then I will hear what I was almost in tears. And then he asked me what brought me. And I told him a little bit of my crime. And he said, hey, do you know this government is going to kill you? Oh, my God. What was life like? I was like? crestfallen. Yeah, in, in prison. And uh, I said, yes, old man, I knew that the government was going to kill me. Then he asked me this profound question. Yeah. So do you want to die? And I, I asked old man, if there is a way out... I want to leave. But as I stand here, old man, there is no, way, no out. way out. Then he told me, there is a man that can get, help you out of this situation. I got curious. I thought it was a man, probably a government official or an yeah. astute lawyer or yeah. something. And he told me none of that. But the man that can get you out of this place, his name is Jesus Christ. He told you that in He told prison. me. He says, Jesus Christ can get you out of this situation. Wow. Wow. Put your hands together, guys. I mean, for, for the sake of time, I think we don't have that much to I, talk about. Yeah. I'm so going let's, to, let's I'm going fast to, forward. I'm going yeah. to fast forward. So I believe the old man's word. He asked me to fast and pray. I fasted and prayed. That was but the first I, time ever fasting uh, and prayed. When, when you even mentioned the fasting, I was scared. You know, because <laughs> if I don't eat by 8 a.m., I will die. Yeah. But then trouble pushed me to the point that I started fasting and praying. Mm. And I began to seek the face of God. This God I never knew about. But deep down in the night, I get on my knees and I cry to this God I didn't know. And my whole prayer was that, Father, forgive me for what I have done and make a way out. Deliver me from the barrel of the gun because I was going to die. Mm. And I was praying this prayer without realizing what was it. Nine days I went fasting. On the night day, a man of God came into the prison, ministered the word, and accepted Christ as Lord and personal Savior. Yeah. That night the Lord revealed himself to me. Hold on with this. Hold on with this. But we're going to take a break. We'll be back and we'll hear more. Purchase your Forever Clear sanitizers and help support the eradication of COVID-19. Reverend David G. Mercy is here telling us about his story, his life, 19 years in jail, how God came through for him, and how today he's dedicated his life to ensuring that everyone stays on the right path. And he told us so much, but it's the juiciest part that we're about to listen to. So, Reverend, let's carry on. But I hope that you, you're enjoying yourself. Yeah? Okay. Let's do this, Reverend. So the Lord revealed himself to me, and the Lord showed me what I needed to do. And then he showed me a picture of the day he had gotten me out of prison. All in I a saw dream. It as, yes, it came in, a, so in the form of a dream. But there were about nine different kinds of dreams. In fact, the Lord told me everything that was going to happen to me in the problem. Hmm. 
till the day I was released. And the condition was this. Tell the police the truth and I will get you out. Eventually, I told the police the truth. I sent them to the crime scene. They went and gathered all this evidence. And it was obvious that the ultimate sentence was going to be given to me. In a month and a half time, I was arraigned before the public tribunal. When I talk about public tribunal, I don't know whether you know what the kind of tribunal I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the kind of courts we have today. Mm. I'm talking about the PNDC, People's Regional Tribunal. Okay. The court before where you go, sometimes your sentence is already determined oh. before the case starts. <laughs> so wow. even before the case started, I knew the you sentence knew. that yeah. I was going to get. The government took five days. But my trial was like, it can be, my trial can be, can be likened to the day President Clinton came to Ghana. Hmm. The kind of crowd that visited him, that welcomed him. Wow. The whole of the high street. But at a point on my judgment day, I realized that most of the workers within the high street region area had been given leave off to come and witness the trial. The illegal you could, leave? Oh, yes. Because you could determine the Bank of Ghana officials here by their uniform. Okay. Leave, the Ghana Commercial Bank, the ministries. You could see different kinds of uniforms that were seated. The government wow. arranged it in such a way to show to the whole world that the PLDC government had nothing to do with this crime. Mm -hmm. It's just a little, little naughty yes, boy yeah. that has created this problem. And eventually, I was sentenced to death by firing squad. And when they took me and they were sending me to Isawam to await my death penalty, there was this hope in me because God had told me that I shall not die, yeah. but I will go and come back. come back. My dear sister, in the condemned prison, I forgot entirely about what God had told me. Hmm. Because the kind of things that I saw there, the times when government sent in the executioners to pick condemned prisoners and execute them by firing squad. I saw it twice. Wow. When they come in, they come in with a list of names on a torn rough sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. And when they come, they mention one name. The condemned prison is like a, a story building. It's a story building. Okay. And then we have the upstairs and the downstairs. They stand downstairs, and then they shout out the name in the building. It's a closed building. And when they shout out the name, and it's not your name, you don't know whose name is next because they haven't informed you they are coming. So before they mention the second name, your soul will run out of you. Oh, my God. And when the name is mentioned, it's not your name, then you come alive again, yeah. waiting for waiting the next for the name. Next. And between each name is of a period of about seven to ten minutes. They intentionally suspend, they oh delay the God. thing to torture you, <laughs> traumatize you, you know, so by the time the next name is mentioned again, you are dead. You are dead, yeah. And when the name is mentioned and it's not your name, then you breathe again. Oh. So if the names are 9 or 15, you will die nine, nine times, times and resuscitate nine times. Hey. My first experience, I, my legs could not carry me. I was, I, was, I was shivering so much so that I could not stand. I Even had to break onto the ground. Even though God had revealed to you. At that moment, you forget everything. <laughs> wow. The fear comes so much that, it's just like in our times of corona, God has given a lot of people promises, but because corona is prevailing in the yeah, system, forgotten. you forget. <laughs> Everybody is taking every precaution to make sure yeah. that you leave, okay? Yeah. And um, life in the condemned prison was very tough. After the first execution, that was the next, the two nights mm -hmm. after I had gone there. Everyone knew it was because of me, the government has. But lo and behold, I survived. Yeah. Nobody came for me. And then in the con it was in a condemned prison that I really melted for God. Mm. I gave my life wholly to God. And it, we, we, had, we had Christians, men who had also committed various crimes of all sorts, who had yeah. found themselves there, who had given their hearts to God. To God. See, so we did nothing in the condemned prison but seeking the face of God, reading your Bible, praying, mm. fellowshipping, worshipping, nothing, 24-7, that is what we That's did. What the only different thing we did was to bath and eat. On the 17th July 1993 was the last execution we had here. Little did I know that I was part of that execution. I never knew. But God had revealed it to me. Okay. And I didn't know what it meant. Yeah. Because the way the signs and figures he used, I didn't understand them. On that night, the government sent in the executioners. And 19 condemned prisoners were picked and executed by firing squad. 19? 19. 19. Only for my father to tell me a week later. He asked me, David, do you know you were part of that execution? And I said, Daddy, how? And he said, your name was part of it. 
But lo and behold, the interior minister at the time was your father. He was my father's colleague in the army. Oh. And when he saw my name, he said, nobody can kill my son. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And that is how my name was struck out. Because of me, one condemned prisoner was dropped. Because they don't execute even numbers. Oh, it's supposed to be an it's odd not number. Two, it's not one, two, four. No, it should be an odd number. Oh, so okay. when they dropped, the names were 21. When they dropped my name, it became 20. It became 20. So they they dropped drop. one man to become 19. And the rest of the 19 were shot to death. We're learning a lot, you know, because I didn't even know that, you know, it has to be an odd number. We don't have much time, so we have to quickly so, wrap up. So let me wrap up. tell me about the day you walked out, how it happened, and then we can... Yeah. So, based upon what God had told me, I thought my stay in the condemned prison was going to be very short. One year came, two years came, three years came, four years, five years, six years, seven years, eight years, nine years, ten years. I became so frustrated. I thought the promise of God was not coming to pass. One day in 2003, in June... Then President Kufo was in power, mm -hmm. and an amnesty was announced that anyone that had served 10 years on the death row and was still alive with good conduct, mm -hmm. his sentence should be commuted from death to right. life. Okay. So that got me out of the condemned prison, and now I became a life sentence prisoner. I was very angry with God because then I didn't know God was about something. Mm -hmm. But when I went back to God, he told me that there were certain lessons that he needed to teach me again. So I should humble myself. In no time, I was elevated in the prison. I became one of the leaders. And oh. lo and behold, it's another story to tell. Wow. I became very active in Isawan prison. It's very, very active in Isawan prison. And to the point that even the prison authorities took note of the transformation that I had gone through. I became a leader, a Christian leader in the system. Okay. And I did a lot for the prison administration mm. and the prisoners. And lo and behold, five years down the line, President Kofor was finally leaving power. And we heard that the president wanted to pardon some prisoners. Mm -hmm. Who and who was going, nobody knew. Didn't know. But at the point, I had given up hope because there was no way I was going to be involved in this. But lo and behold, when the names were being compiled, the prison authorities compiled the names and my name was included. Oh, my God. So one day, I was called to the office and I was told that the president of the Republic of Ghana, President Kufo, has pardoned me to go home. Oh, oh my God. How was it like leaving the place? And did you go back to your dad? Unfortunately, my dad passed on oh. before I came out of prison. He didn't see this, this part of me. But how was it like walking out of prison knowing you're a free man? As a matter of fact, it was the day I came out of prison that I realized that the air you people breathe outside is different from what we breathe in prison. Oh, yes. Freedom is a gift mm. that God has given to every human being. We need to guard it with all diligence. Because until it is taken from you, you don't know that the wealth are two. Mm. Life behind bars is another thing. And freedom is also another, another thing. thing. That was the day that I got to know that a human being can breathe fresh air. Yeah. Because in prison, mm -hmm. the place is enclosed. I give out mine, you take you it, take you take it, and give it back uh, to me. Unfortunately, there's no time. We have to wrap up. Yeah. But Reverend David G. Mercy, we're going to get you back I'll be sometime to tell us more. Because I'm sure you want to hear more, right? Mm -hmm. But just in case you want to know more as well. So he has two books. Yeah. We have the first one, Volume 1, which is years, 19 yes. Years in Prison mm -hmm. by Reverend David G. Mercy. And this probably tells the story of what he has already yeah. narrated. Yeah. Now, there's a sequel to it, and this is 19 Years in, in prison, prison, a sequel prison. to Volume 1, one David volume G. Mercy. So this two. is what talks about life Vo after? No, this life in prison and out. And out. And this is life outside before prison. Okay, yes. okay. Till the day I was condemned. And, and after I was condemned, till I came out of prison. Yeah. 19 years. 19 It took me 25 years. years to write this story. 25 years? Wow. I kept documenting everything. God, God told me that we were going to write a book. So document everything that happens in your life. Oh, my God. Listen, I think he deserves a standing ovation. Honestly. Honestly speaking, I have interviewed people, but I've never, ever come across a story as touching as this one. Reverend, thank you so much for sharing with us. God bless you, my dear sister. Thank you very much. And 
There's a reason why we're all here at this moment. Mm -hmm. There's a reason someone is watching at this moment. Mm -hmm. And whatever it is that God intends to do with this story mm -hmm. that he shared, I hope and pray that it happens. Yeah. Reverend David mm -hmm. G. Mercy has mm -hmm. been our special guest mm -hmm. for today. And I can already say that this has so far been the best um, episode of the day show already. Mm -hmm. We're just a few episodes in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But thank you God for sharing you. with us. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming, by the way. And I know you would have wanted to speak. I know you have questions. You can do that after. Yeah? But to you watching us as well, this is the reason why The Day Show is here to stay. And it's the reason why you should continue sticking with us. Because we have so much up our sleeves. Thank you to the producers, to the directors, to the entire crew for making this show a possibility. Thank you to Forever Claire as well for coming through for us. To see my brew to own my hair and to face you. I'm grateful for styling me. I will see you again next week with another exciting episode. Thank you. And keep watching TV3.